I, I went to bed last night uh, really late. You know, hadn't looked at news or anything. I woke up this morning really early just to, to refresh myself, look at my message, make sure everything was good. And uh, before I did that, though, I sat down and I just was reading through the news. And all of a sudden, it was like USA Today, CNN, Fox, Google, everything was all about this thing that happened in Charlottesville yesterday. And if, if you don't know, because you were with me at Shanty Days, um, you know, there was the that uh, white supremacist group that was going to protest something about some Confederate thing being removed in Virginia. And then there was, so they were protesting, and then you had the other people protesting the protesters saying, you know, it's, white supremacy is terrible and all that. And so there was some violence involved, and then somebody rams a car in the midst of all of it and kills some people, like 19 people are hurt. It, it was horrible. So everybody was talking about it yesterday, except for those of us in Shanty Days. And I was, watch, I was reading some tweets, uh, because that's what you do nowadays, and, um, you know, and the, one party is criticizing the other party because they're not doing enough, or this is the result of all of the policies that we have, and you're like, it's just crazy stuff, everybody using this horrible stuff, and I was sitting there thinking, before I was reading my message, going, what, how is the church supposed to respond to this? Because a lot of these groups claim to be from, you know, churches, or I think of Westboro Baptist, and all these horrible, like, pictures of what the church is supposed to be. And I was sitting there thinking, how are we supposed to respond? I have no idea. And I started reading some, some tweets of friends in the church world, and they're like, this is, if the church has to respond. And I'm like, what, how, how do we respond to this? I don't even, I, I don't know what to do. And so that's, that, that's how I go into opening my message this morning. <laughs> and so I'm reading my message and it starts, it, it starts with this cute, like, audience participation thing. And I was like, oh. And then as I'm reading down it, I'm like, this is n- so trite. This is not, it's good message. And you'll get to hear it next week. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I just, I was like, this isn't sitting well. We were going to talk about Paul and Barnabas. And it was, it's, it was really a good message, but it wasn't for today. Because this story kept going in my head all morning long that I was like, this needs to be the unexpected story we talk about today. It's too bad I haven't prepared it. <laughs> and um, but at, So I kept reading my message going, no, you got to understand, I'm a planner. Okay, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a processor. I, you tell me something, and I'll be like, God, that's good or bad. But then I think about it, and you know, six hours later, I'll come back going, I was wrong. It's, it, what you said is right, or I just need to process. So that's the way I work. So only once in my life have I ever changed a sermon at the last minute. And it was like 9-11 kind of thing. And then this morning, I'm like, Lord, I don't know if I should do this. And by the way, when pastors say they hear from God, they usually don't mean like, dawn. Preach the good Samaritan. It's, it's rarely like that. Usually it's like, oh, should I? Should I? And then I kept reading my message going, I don't want to preach that. Well, <laughs> I only got another option. So we're going to have some fun today because we're going to do something that I have never done. A little bit more spontaneous, but I think we're going to have a good time because as I read the good Samaritan over and over this morning, I was blown away at how I mean, you didn't even know we weren't going to do the Good Samaritan story. So welcome to the unexpected story of the day. We're going to do the good, did I say the good American? The good Samaritan. Um, So if you have your Bible, open up to Luke 10, because that's where we're going to be today, because this is really an amazing story. Um, Yeah, we'll just jump right in. All right, so in Luke 10, verse 25, if you have your Bible, if not, it'll be on the screens. It says, on one occasion, an expert of the law, basically a lawyer in in the Jewish world in the first century, stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, first century, the teacher, the the rabbi, the the one who is going to share, he sits and the students stand I don't know why it was like that. What a horrible way. Nobody can see. I know. It's, thank goodness we've changed that. Now the teacher stands. But back then, that was the way it was. Teachers sat. Students stood. So if you were standing, you were basically in the posture of, you are the teacher. You are the one who has the information to teach me. So it's a, standing was submissive. And so you have a lawyer standing and Everybody thinks he's just a te- you know, being a student like everybody else, except that he wants to test Jesus. And he says, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, if a lawyer 
is going to test a rabbi? That is not the normal question you would ask. Because think about it. What can you do to inherit anything? Inherit. You don't do anything to inherit. You are born into an inheritance. You, so it's, it's a ridiculous question anyway. But that's, that's the point of that question is that it can't be answered because you can't do anything to inherit something. It is given to you freely. But you would have expected the lawyer to say, how do I obey God? Or how do I get to heaven in the way we would say? How do I obey God? And the answer would have, the, the lawyer would have expected to hear, well, you'd be a good Jew. Obey the Torah. Be a good Jew. You obey God. You get all the promises of God. That's not what he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And so verse 26, Jesus kind of appeases what he's saying. Obey the Torah kind of thing. What is it written in the law? Jesus replies, how do you read it? You can just see Jesus, you know, okay, I'll bite. You're asking me a question that is obviously a test because you can't do anything to inherit eternal life. So uh, I'll bite. What do you think? What does the law say? What, what, Mr. Lawyer guy, what, what do you think Jesus is, or what do you think the law is saying? How do you read it? I love that. And then verse 27, the, the, the man answers, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Who said those words? Right here, it was the man. But where have we heard those words before? Yeah, Jesus says those words all the time. And what's interesting is he didn't create those words, but he created the phrasing. He created the way it sounds. But the, you know, these, these verses, um, the love God with all your heart comes from uh, Deuteronomy 6. That is Deuteronomy 6, 5 says, love the Lord your God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord God, he is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your strength, your soul, your body, whatever the translation is, your whole being. Love him. And then uh, Leviticus 19 says, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus puts these together in that same phrasing. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. The lawyer quotes it perfectly the way Jesus was. So you know, he knows what Jesus has said. He's trying to test Jesus. So he throws his own answers back. And then verse 28, Jesus replies, you've, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Think about this. Do this and you will have eternal life. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Raise your hand if you've done that perfectly this week. Yeah, I know, it's impossible. So the guy's like, well, this is what you do because he's quoting back to Jesus. Well, the guy doesn't believe that because it's impossible. I mean, you can't do this perfectly. And so Jesus is like, yeah, okay, you got a 20-foot wall, climb over the wall and you can, you can love God. And they're like, nobody can climb the wall. Exactly, it's impossible. But do this and you will live. And so verse 29, and we're gonna get to the story. This is kind of the setup. But he wanted to justify himself, the lawyer did. So he asked Jesus, Okay, who's my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? So the guy is like, the lawyer's like, I'm good with, love the Lord your God, I'm good with all of this, okay. Love your neighbor as yourself. Let's, let's clarify some definitions here, Jesus. Who's, who's your neighbor? And this is where the rub comes in. Because if you would have asked the tax, uh, the tax collector, wrong story, the lawyer, how do you define neighbor? What would he have said? A Jew, a good Jew. Who is my neighbor? A Jew. Over and over in Scripture, you see in the Old Testament, love, love your fellow Jew. You know, we support each other. They're a family. They were never supposed to be inclusive because in, all the way back in the beginning, it was like, Abraham, you are going to be a blessing to the nations. The whole world will be blessed through you. And over and over in the Old Testament, it says, um, treat people who are on the outside who come in, treat them as if they were a native born. If you, and if you ever want to look that up, it's, it's Leviticus 19. It's at the end of the chapter. When people come in who are outside, who are Gentiles, and they want to be a part of your family, let them is in as if they were native born. It's in the Torah. They seem to forget those verses because it was all about being, it's us. My neighbor is a Jew. That's how he would have answered it. And that goes into the story. 
So we're going to be in uh, Luke 10.30 today. In reply to all that the man said, Jesus said, okay, there was a man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's about a 17-mile trip. You wish it was 17 miles flat, but the um, Jerusalem's like 1,500, 2,000, 3,000. It could be 100,000. I don't know, feet above sea level. I'm kidding. It's really high, though. And if you're in a car going from Jerusalem to Jericho, it's kind of like being in the, you know, the mountains here in America where they have the signs that say, don't, don't ride your brakes, because you're going so fast. I mean, you can go zero to 100 and, and just keep going faster and faster because it is an incline that is crazy. It's exhausting. So a man's going, man, man's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he gets mugged. It says that um, he was attacked by robbers, which was very common because the roads were thin, and you could hide. Again, you know, do you remember the way, like, in the Old Testament, they used to, like, execute people? It was by stoning? There's a reason for that. If you ever go to Israel, you will never see more stones in your entire life. It is the stoniest, rockiest place in the world. It's ridiculous. I mean, seriously, you're like, oh, gar- oh, a garden of rocks. Oh, look, another garden of rocks. Wow, people are growing rocks everywhere because you can't get away from them. And you could, robbers would hide behind them. And so, you know, they might let groups of people go, but then there's that single guy. That's the one they're going to hit. So it was really dangerous. And um, so a robber attacked this guy, and it says they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Good times. Verse 31. A priest happened to be going down by the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by the other side. What's really funny is we think of like a road in America where you have the left and the right. And um, yeah, they didn't have that. So you can just imagine you're like... <laughs> Except he probably was on an animal. So he's like, step over him, you know? And this, Because the priest, back in the day, there were like three categories of people who, who would w- work in the temple. And the priest was the highest one because he, was, he had the job from her heritage. He was born into being a priest. You didn't just become a priest. You had to be a son of Aaron. And so this guy, he, they were usually rich, which is why he probably was on a horse. He uh, was elite. He was, he was the upper class. And so for him, you know, he's looking at this guy saying, uh, okay. And you can imagine what the priest is thinking. He sees the, the, the guy on the ground you know, beaten, naked, probably unconscious because he said he was half dead. Is he a Jew or not? I don't know. Again, Jews and Arabs look, they have very similar looks. I mean, they they have the same heritage. (laughs) They go all the way back to Abraham. I can't tell if this is a Jew or a Gentile. Um, Now, what does the law say? Well, the law says if he's a Jew, I need to, I need to, take care of him, but, but if he's not a Jew, I have no responsibility at all. And, but if he's dead and he's a Jew, I have no responsibility. I mean, he's a priest. If he touch, I mean, he's coming down from Jerusalem to Jericho, which was so normal because most of the priests would live in Jericho and they would go up like two weeks out of the year to do their temple service. So he had already been up for two weeks in Jerusalem doing his temple service. He's heading back home. If he touches that dead guy, He has to turn around, go back to Jerusalem, up that horrible, horrible incline for how many miles? Because who who knows how far he is down the road. He has to go back up, and he has to be purified for about a week. (sighs) He hasn't seen his family in two weeks. He is ready to be done. And so, and if he's dead, what can I do anyway? So he decides that his ceremonial uh, purification was a bigger deal than helping the guy. And so he he walks over. 32, verse 32. says, so too, a Levi, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now, Levites were under the priests. They were the temple assistants. The Levite, he he probably, I mean, the good chance is that, I know it's a parable, but the good chance is that the, the priest was ahead of him. So the Levite's behind him probably walking, sees the priest skip the guy who's, who's half dead on the road. And he's like, well, I mean, if I help the, the guy who's down, I'm going to make the priest look bad. And I mean, he set the precedent. So it was a, for the Levite, it was an easy one to just kind of, we're good, he's, he's, he's bad. So 
The next thing. Okay, let's go back to storytelling in the first century. You, there's three classes of people who work in the temple. The priest, the Levite, and the layman. So when, the, when Jesus is telling this story, this parable, everybody hears the priest walks over. And that's kind of expected. And everybody hears the Levite walk over. Well, that was more expected. Everybody was thinking the next person in the story is going to be the layman. And who knows what he's going to do? I mean, everybody knew something was about to happen because that's a good story. But they thought it was going to be the layman. And it wasn't. Because in verse 33, it says, Jesus says, But then a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And we, when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. So not expected. I know a lot of you know what a Samaritan is, but um, back then, about, gosh, 500, 600 years before this moment, the Jews had been exiled, and we actually talked about that story with Esther. And when the Jews were allowed to go back, or I'm sorry, I just told you the wrong story. It was about 800 years earlier. The Assyrians came in and destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel, wiped them out. Those who were left, the Assyrians they just knew how to make everybody so happy. They brought people from all around the empire and made them settle in the northern kingdom of Israel. And the Jews, there weren't many of them. And, you know, they had a rule, you're not allowed to intermarry, but they never made that rule before. Why start now? So they started intermarrying and, and they, they changed the, the Torah uh, or they changed the way they did religion and everybody only used the Torah. They did not believe in the prophets. They didn't believe in a lot of the, the Old Testament. They only read those first five books of the Bible, and they, were, they started calling themselves Samaritans because their capital was Samaria. So the Jews in Jerusalem always looked up to those Samaritans as people who were half-breeds. They did not even believe the Bible the way we do. And they just had so much animosity. And the Samaritans were the same way. They're like, you think you're better than us. You think you're the only ones who have the real deal. And so there was this, this competition between them, and they, they truly hated each other, more than the Miami Dolphins and the New York Jets, like I told you last week. It was worse. Packers and Bears, is that the right one? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was worse than that. And so, I know, it's terrible. And so... When everybody was expecting the story to be a lay person, and it was a Samaritan who travels and takes pity on the guy who, and, and, and you assume he's a Jew, the guy who's down, because that's what makes the story so weird, and then takes him, uh, it says, he went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then, then, uh, then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. It's so funny how we as Americans, we read that, and we have pictures in our mind of what that looks like. But let's think about this. Jericho. I, I wish I had a map, but again, sorry, spontaneous. Jericho is in what country back then? The, the, the Jewish area. The, you know, we would call it Israel, the Palestine area. It's, this was a Jewish town. This is where the priests lived. Jericho. The Samaritan, do you think he'd feel welcome in a, in a Jewish town? Not at all. See, that, you, you, you miss this when you don't know all the this, this story, and you go, I mean, think of it. This is like a Native American in the 1880s seeing a cowboy on the ground, taking care of him, putting him on his horse, and walking into Dodge City. The Indian's not even sure if he's going to make it out. I said Indian. It's Native American. The, the Native American is not even sure he can make it out of Dodge City alive. He is risking his life just being there. That's the power. I mean, that's why this story is crazy for them because they're like, what? The Samaritan is not only risk, you know, having his time, taking that away. He's not only using his own money and stuff to take care of the guy. He's going into a city that probably wants to kill him just to care for one of them. Who does this sound like? Jesus. And that's, that's the point of the story. So, next verse, 35. says, The next day he took out two denarii, which is about a week or two's worth of care, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any expense that you may have. And then Jesus looked at the guy and said, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And you've got to love the answer. 
Because in verse 37, the expert in the law replied. He didn't say the Samaritan. He said the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. The Jew couldn't even bring himself to say the name of the, the Samaritan, the what Jesus called him. No, no, he's just the man who, because, I mean, he knew. I hate this, you know. <laughs> I'm trying to trap this guy, and every time one of us tries to trap him, he turns it around, and you leave feeling guilty. <laughs> hate that. <laughs> because he always, Jesus had this way of exposing your hatred, and he had this way of exposing your biases against other people in such a way that is amazing. And you know what's really interesting is Jesus never did answer the original question. Who is my neighbor? He never answered that. He answered the bigger question. Who am I to become a neighbor to? See, that's the kicker. Anytime I see a need, anytime I see injustice done, anytime I see hatred, anytime I see people who needs something I have, I am to be a neighbor. Whether I live next to them, whether they're American, whether whether they're Muslim, whether they're anything that, you know, you go, "I I don't believe that. Every time we see a need, we want to be like the Samaritan. We want to be like the half breed, the one nobody likes, who is the hero of the story. The law expert, he, um, he realized immediately he could not, this, he couldn't justify himself because everybody who was listening to the story was so blown away that it was a Samaritan. I mean, you just, we can't understand the hatred that, that they experienced from the time they were born. What's funny is we see that hatred because we can watch TV and we see in certain areas of the world this kind of hatred that's just bred in you from the beginning, kind of like those white supremacists who are in Virginia. It's just, it's like they can't even see beyond it. That, that's the way this law expert was. He was so, could not imagine a Samaritan being the hero of any story that when Jesus said, be like the Samaritan, it was beyond his capacity. He couldn't do it. And neither can we. See, this is what's so amazing. We can't love on our own. I mean, if we are not intentionally trying to fall in love with Jesus and get to know him, this love inside of us is always going to come up short. I, I heard about a girl this week. Um, I was reading a little bit of her story. She uh, was, you know, great in high school. She, her parents thought she was going to be a lawyer because that's what she wanted to do. Everything was going great. And she went to a mission trip to Uganda. And when she was in Uganda, her heart broke for those people. And she came back and said to her mom, and she's about to graduate high school, I'm going to go be a missionary in Uganda. Her mom's like, you're crazy. You're too smart for that. You're too good. God has too much planned for you to just go and work in an orphanage in Uganda. And she ticked her parents off. Her friends were like, you're crazy. What are you doing? Right when she graduated, she started doing this mission thing and went to Uganda and started helping orphans. Nobody understood. And, And what's amazing is she would write back saying, this is the greatest thing I've ever done in my entire life. I am filled in a way I have never been filled. And all of the people who are back in America were thinking, I mean, you know, because she she said in her book, they're thinking, I wish I could have more. You know, they're America, they're they're us. I want more. I wish I had more to pay the bills. I wish I had more stuff. I think you're crazy, yet I'm empty. And she's like, every time I talked to people back in the States, it was like they were telling me I'm crazy, but then I would hear how empty they were. And here I am saying I am fuller. Is that a word? I am more full than I've ever been in my life, more than I ever could have imagined, yet I have nothing. How is that possible? Jesus Christ. He fills us in a way that, I mean, we want to buy stuff. We want more. I, I remember when I was in my 20s or 30s or 40s. I don't remember which. But um, I, I, loved, I loved, that's a lie. I love playing video games sometimes. I have no time, so don't worry about it. I promise you, I haven't played in days. And, um, uh, but I remember I would want a video game, and, but I'm cheap. And so I'd wait for it to go on sale, and then I would buy it but I never had time to play it. Or I would buy it and I would never play it because I had other stuff that I wanted to do. And then, oh, I'd see another one and I'd buy it. 
because I wanted it, and I knew it would fill the void. But I would never play it. It was like once I bought it, I didn't want it anymore. It was the most weird thing. And I started seeing this pattern in me going, why do I want stuff? that I, it doesn't fill me, and then I just go to the next thing. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's what we all do. We all do that. I just want a bigger house. You get the bigger house, and all of a sudden, it's like my car's not big enough, and then you get a bigger car, and then, you know, and it closes. And, and it's like we always try to fill the void. And there's this girl in Uganda saying, I gave it all up, and I am happier and more fulfilled than I've ever been in my life. We can only become full through Jesus. When we seek him and we love him, his love enters us and it starts spilling over so that rather than doing church work for many of us, I mean, because so many of you do so much around here, but rather than doing it in the flesh because we have to or we see a need and we just have to fill it, all of a sudden we're, we're serving because we love people. I'm not doing a job for an organization or a building. I'm doing a job for this person that I love. Maybe, you know, the, our, uh, the teachers who are teaching our children, when they're teaching because they love these kids, it's so different than, uh, I saw a need. Mm-hmm. But that only comes, that perspective only comes through God mm-hmm. and, and Him working in us. And the only way that that happens is we actually have to do something. We have to work at knowing Him and loving Him. The first commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You can't do that. On your own? I mean, it's impossible. It's too big. But you can do some of the things and let God start transforming your heart. Start you know, reading, reading the scriptures. This is an amazing book. I mean, this book is worthy of our whole life investment. It's amazing. And I know it's hard to understand, which is why I always say, get one of these that are easy. Get, I mean, there are... Go to a bookstore, or better yet, I keep talking about it, you think I'm selling it as a commercial, but the YouVersion Bible app, or Bible.com, has every translation that I know of in English. Start going through them and seeing which one, which one makes sense. And because you, I don't want you to struggle with the language. I want, you to str- I want you to struggle with the content, because it is worthy of struggling with and wrestling with this stuff. We're called to love but we don't have it in us to love. But Jesus does, and he wants to fill us to help those who are treated unjustly, to help those who don't have what we have. I love America. I love our country. Every, watching the flag go by yesterday in that parade, I'm proud to stand up, take off my hat, and put my hand in my heart. I love our country. But it's not an equal playing field. People don't, they don't have the options I have. I have, some, I have great options. Some people are born into hate, and they can't see anything except everybody's out to get me. I, you know, I think about those white supremacists yesterday, and the whole country hates them and is angry, and I, am, I get that. I feel so sorry for them. How, how could you look at the beautiful landscape of America, the color and beauty of our country, and think nobody's as good as me? I can't even imagine that. Jesus has a way of changing perspective. So let's get to know him so that we can help those in need. And we can, make, we can be God's instrument to help his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, when, when we see injustice, as Americans, we go fight and take it over. Use your power and wield it. And we are like that because we have power. I mean, we, are, we spend so much money on military. We are the strongest in the world. And by the way, I like that. I want to be the strongest. Okay, I, I'm an American, okay. But as Christians, fighting doesn't cure fighting. I'm not talking about governments. I am, this is not a political statement. I'm talking about me, Don, you, follower of Jesus. It's not wielding power. Jesus had all of the power in the universe at his disposal. And he let those who, were, who he was coming to save, he let them nail him to a cross. It's sacrifice. Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls it costly grace. When we are willing to sacrifice as smart as we are and as wonderful as we are and as many resources as we have to do great things for God, when we're willing to say, 
I give it up for you and you and you. Nobody. No, I mean, that's what the Samaritan did. And it's hard. And it's countercultural. And you might never want me to come back and preach again. I know. <laughs> but I, with all of my heart, I know that Jesus, it's power that's submitted to others. That is what we as Christians are called. We have all the power in the world. We have a future with him. And he calls us to submit to him. It's good stuff. You know, I, there was a, a couple of stories that came to my mind. Um, do you remember a couple of years ago, maybe 20, 100, I don't know, uh, when that, uh, that, that gunman went into the Amish school and killed all of those children? Do you, I mean, those of us who are, are older might remember that. Um, and I remember the story that happened out of that was that literally the next day, the parents of some of the children in this Amish community who were killed, I mean, the parents of their slain children were at the house of the murderer ministering to his family because he had a wife and kids. And they had no idea what was going on. I mean, they could not believe daddy just killed all these other kids in this school. And the wife was left alone. I mean, her husband just killed a bunch of children. And the parents were there ministering. They could have hated her. And most of us would have said, that's fairly justified. I mean, it's understandable. It might not be good, but it's understandable. They didn't. They went and ministered to her. And then I was thinking, you know, I'm from the Orlando area. And just a couple of years ago, uh, there was that, that shooting in, in the uh, homosexual nightclub or whatever. And I remember seeing tweets that were horrible. But do you know who some of the first responders were outside of the police and the paramedics and all that? Were churches. There were churches going, we don't care if we disagree or agree with beliefs. You are human beings in need. What can we do? And they were caring for people and loving, for pe loving people and saying, whatever you need. They were ministering to families of the slain. They were ministering to people who were scared to death who were there. And I was like, that is beautiful. That's what Jesus would do. Because it's not about, you don't believe like me. That's what the Pharisees all believed. That's what the, tax, the, the, the lawyer guy believed. It is, I see a need. Jesus sacrificed for the people who did not agree with him. <laughs> he died for the people who did not agree with him. And he says, for me, to do the same. If you want to follow me, what do you do? Take up your cross. It's hard. Now, I'm sorry that you're getting uh, <laughs> all of this. You know, I, I was thinking about all of this all morning long, going, I don't know how to respond to what happened. And I don't even know if it was a big deal to anybody else. But for me, I was like, what? what have we come to? And honestly, it wasn't what happened. It was the tweets. What have we come to when we're so mean to each other? Even those of us who weren't involved, Democrats saying the stupid Republicans, Republicans, Republicans saying the stupid Democrats, both of them saying, all this is your fault. No, it's not. We live in a sinful world. And the we as believers need to start to show, show love. Will we change the world? We'll change somebody's world. Mm -hmm. Jesus will change the world one day. Amen. He will change it one day. Is that okay that I said all that? All right. No, you don't, don't clap for me, please. <laughs> I'm making it up as I go along. That's never worthy of my <laughs> um, <laughs> Now, um, I want to close with this, because again, all morning I'm like, and how do you end this, Don? Um, I don't know if you're a follower of Jesus or not. I'm glad you're here. We as a church want to be the Samaritan to you, no matter how you've come, no matter what you believe, no matter what you've done in your life and how far you've fallen or how great you've risen. We want to be the Samaritan to you. We want to say, we love you. What needs do you have? I want to invite you, though. Maybe you're here and you have not lived that way. Maybe you've been a follower of Christ and you've been really judgmental. And those who don't believe like you, you've always looked at them and said, they're just stupid or they're just going to hell. Well, and sometimes we see Christians say that with a smile. <laughs> they're just going to hell. Oh, my goodness. This is not flippant. <laughs> so maybe you've been judgmental. I want to ask you, would you look to Jesus and repent? And be like, and say, God, I can't, there's hatred in me, there's judgment in me, I can't get it out, but I'm offering it to you. Begin changing me. Would you do that today? Because we are the hands and feet of Jesus. And if you're lost, which means that you are looking 
<laughs> Lost is not a bad thing. I'm looking. I haven't found what I'm looking for. If you are seeking, Jesus wants you to know he loves you. He died for you. didn't matter what you did. He died for you. And he wants to invite you to follow him. It is a tough road. Just like that girl in Uganda, but it's the greatest thing you've ever done. It satisfies in a way that an Xbox game never will. <laughs> it satisfies a, like better than a front, front row seat at a Green Bay Packer game. I mean, it is good. And it is hard, but it's the greatest journey you'll ever be on. So I want to invite you to that. And so let's pray together. I know the band's going to come up, and I have one more announcement before they sing. Jesus, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing um, that I changed this morning's message, but I give it to you. I pray, Lord, that you do something in our hearts. Christians all over the world really struggle to be people who love. It's so easy to judge. We think we have it right. We think we know what we're doing. And we look down at other people, even within our own faith, and say, you're not like me, therefore you're, I, I can't even be in your presence or whatever. Help us to not be judgmental. God, if, not if, all of us in this room struggle with some of that, I pray, Lord, that you will expose it to us. And I pray that you will give us the courage to repent and give it back to you and say, change us. Help us to be loving. This isn't about belief. Belief's important. But it's more important to love. So help us. And Lord, if there are people in here who don't know you, I ask that you will help them have the courage to, to choose you, to follow you right now. Just to say, God, I don't know what I'm doing, but I give it to you. I will follow you. Help us. Help us keep our eyes on Jesus, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen.